Welcome to our second meeting of the course Visual Narratives in Primary Education. You know that this is a special course we started um, a few days ago and the idea is that we can not only benefit from working together in class but also connecting with other districts from the Region 25. Uh, the first attempt at this task was very successful, we believe, despite the difficult, uh, difficulties we had in terms of technology. Uh, we are working on that. We are doing our very best to overcome the technical difficulties and to do what we can in order to bring the three districts working together this time um, in order to help you share ideas and insights from each of the contexts you work in, Olavarria, Bolivar and Tabalque. Okay, so thank you for being there, thank you for hanging in, and um, we are ready now to work on the second class and to keep on discussing the impact of visual narratives in education and in our schools nowadays. I'd like to start by watching a short video which is that, uh, taken from a TED talk. Uh, you know, the TED talks are administered by the University of Texas, and um, they started in Texas, and then they started quite spreading uh, and taking different people to present their ideas and to give talks on certain topics that are of interest within education, technology and communication. Um, the video we're going to watch right now, as I was saying, comes from a TED talk by Mr. Brian Kennedy, um, who is the principal of a museum um, now in Toledo, and um, he used to be also the director of the Hood Museum, and he's going to tell us why visual literacy is critical in education. Uh, let's kick it off then by watching Mr. Kennedy. I've been involved in visuals all my life. So have you. But it was brought to my attention pretty early. My father practiced as an architect. So quite early on, I learned the difference between a segmental and a triangular pediment. Gables, a mansard roof. When I was 13, an aunt of mine sent me an art postcard for my birthday. And she said, I'll send you one a month if you'd like to collect them. So I started collecting. She slowed down sending. I started to go to art classes at the National Gallery of Ireland in Dublin with Dr. James White, the director, who was an enthusiast for artworks. And by the time I went to college, I had 5,000 postcards. Now think about a postcard. It's not like ripping things out of a book or slides or anything. They're all the same size, so that's a manipulation. The shape, the size is made the same. But you can take 40 Rembrandts and put them all on a table, and you can write the dates of them all. And you can see the progression of an artist's career right in front of your eyes. The imaginative process is something that happens with our eyes, our actual eyes seeing, and the eyes of our minds. The blind Milton, able to create such visual poems. What do we really see? Why do we use the word visionary? Visionary. Far-sighted. Well, the issue is that everything is an image. Everything we see is an image. We see it binocularly, and with our retina, it's upside down, connecting to our optic nerve, to our brain cortex. We see millions of things every day, but unless we connect cognition and memory, we don't remember what we see. So visual literacy, what is it? It's the ability to construct meaning from images. It's not a skill. It uses skills as a toolbox. It's a form of critical thinking that enhances your intellectual capacity. It's not a new concept. In 1969, the International Visual Literacy Association was established. It has an annual conference. It has a journal. But something happened on the way from there to here. 
And we kind of lost visual literacy amid visual studies and visual culture and visual communications and visual graphics. And what's necessary now, surely, it seems to me, is that we integrate, that we reintegrate the capacity of our senses. And why? Because we are now in the digital age. I'm so excited for college and university students all over the world. In December 1991, the World Wide Web went live. That means that 18-year-olds going to college everywhere are digital natives. And I am one of the before and after people. I know what it was like before. And I know what it's like after. I'm one of what you might call the Gutenberg people. Can you imagine what it was like? You had all these illuminated manuscripts, and along they came and said, here's a book. We got hundreds more of them. <laughs> it's fascinating. In the Near Eastern world, you have this great invention of cuneiform writing. And it took us two and a half thousand years, whether in Korea or in Germany, to develop a printing type that would change everything. And it took us only another 500 years to get to where we are now, the digital age. So what indeed was visual literacy like in a pre-literate past? We understand sign language before we understand the printed word. When you think about those cave paintings in the Dordogne region of France, what were people painting? There's no figures in them. They were looking out. They were looking out at the landscape and at the animals, looking out at the world. And when you think of those wonderful stained glass windows that we hardly give time to now, but people read one pain after the other, the entire story. We fast forward to the graphic novel, to cartoons. We need integration now of text and image. I've been finding our text scholars, they say, everything's a text. And I'm equally imperious because I'm saying, everything's an image. The truth is, everything's an image, and it's a text. Visual literacy is multimodal. It's multidisciplinary, it's interdisciplinary, and it's collaborative. It's actually a universal language. Now think about universal languages. Dance, mime, universal languages. Visuals, universal language. You don't have to know Japanese or Gaelic or Polish. We can understand visuals all over the world. So if that's the case, that we can enhance global understanding with visuals, what is it that we're doing to learn how to really see visually? When we were babies, we took in everything. So much so that we actually used up brain cells. Today, we use them up for different reasons. We learned the difference between marked and unmarked space. Can you imagine the difference between one face and another? Basically, they all look the same. So how did we learn the difference? Well, let's try a little game. Clifford Geertz, the great anthropologist in the interpretation of cultures, he quotes a story which is the story of the wink. So let's try it. People at home looking in the mirror, you're looking at me. OK, what I want you to do is twitch your eye. Go on, twitch. Now just wink. Now I want you to wink conspiratorially. <laughs> Try winking romantically. <laughs> A wink can have multiple meanings and means different things in different cultures. The thing about the visual is 90% of all the information we take in from the world, we take in visually. Now, I'm not saying that that makes that 90% more important than the 10% that isn't taken in visually. 
And of course, those who cannot see learn to enhance those powers of the other senses. But I am noting the percentage. A full 30% of the brain cortex is given over to vision. We actually read non-text 60,000 times faster than we can read text. So what I'd like to advocate is a little bit of slow looking. I'd like all of us to be able to look so that we would really, really see. Just like we hear so we could really be listening. Why? Because we need to put some order on our chaos, and we like the idea of harmony among our disharmony. Here's a method for slow looking. You can all use this anywhere. See this thing here. Look at it. When you've actually looked at it, you can begin to see it. And when you can see it, then you can begin to describe it. Quite difficult. And when you can describe it, then you can begin to analyze it. What's it made of, for example? And only after looking and seeing and describing and analyzing can you begin to interpret it, to construct meaning from it. So how much do we look at where we don't engage that process? What we actually need is the alphabet and the grammar of visual literacy. I've worked all my life in art museums, most of it anyway, and I actually believe in the elements and principles of art. There was a time we all used to know them. Here's a little painting I painted earlier. How is it that we know digits and we know letters, but we don't know what ways to approach that? There was a time we would have. We could begin to talk about that in terms of its shape and its form and its volume and its line and its composition, its color, its rhythm, its pattern, its movement, its composition its unity, its value, its hue, its intensity, and so on. A visually literate person can read and write visual language, can encode and decode visual language. You know, there's lots of help available, especially with the internet. There's a fantastic thing on the internet, you know, look it up. It's called the Periodic Table of Visualization Elements. No matter what subject you're using, you can go and look at that. It's fantastic. It puts Mr. Tufty and all the people who've worked on visualization into full focus for us. What visual literacy does, it helps us with classification. That's what I learned with my postcards. The similarities and the differences between things. Stars. Cells. Flowers. Trees. I mean, you walk out on the green and all those poor trees are saying, they didn't notice me. Everyone different. Photographs. All the ways throughout curriculum that we engage the visual. Two towers and a plane. The power of visual images. Did you feel your response as I evoked that image? Visual images have the power to bring our senses together simultaneously and to impact viscerally our emotions. There's a book called Crashing Through. It's an incredible story. It's about a man called Mike May. He had sight until he was three. He lost it. But it was in a chemical explosion, so... When he was 43, through stem cell technology, his sight was recovered. Can you possibly imagine what it would be like to find that sight again 
and to begin to negotiate the world. Close your eyes. Go on, close your eyes. What color is my tie? How would you describe me? What number is on the side of the, I hope, the racing car, I hope you noticed. What was on top of the shelves, on the cases? Open your eyes. Open your eyes. The visual is learned before the verbal. We then start to learn digits and letters. Why is it that we study and are tested for textual literacy and for computer literacy, but not for visual literacy? We need to train our visual capacity. We need to train our ability to construct meaning from images. What we actually need is leadership that recognizes that visual literacy is needed in the curriculum, across the cur curriculum. We need a visual literacy curriculum. And I don't mean what generally happens in art education. I mean across the whole curriculum. How did it happen that we didn't train everybody to be visually literate? I'd like us to be able to use our greatest gifts as fully as possible. I'd like us to recognize that 90% of what we take in in the world, we take in visually. I'd like us to really think about how extraordinary it is to be in the digital age. How, how exciting. Hundreds of years pass and then suddenly something happens that really has changed everything. If we have something that is capable of enhancing our communication across the entire world, something truly universal, if we have something that can truly promote communication, if we have something in visuals that can quite simply change your life, can change the way that you live as we walk out of our house, as we walk out into the world and start to look and see and describe and analyze and interpret. My simple case, visual literacy, we need it. Enjoy your life. Thank you. So, as Mr. Kennedy has just suggested, it is important that we think about the ability visual narratives have to um, enhance our intellectual capacity, as he has put it. Um, it is very important for us to think of that integration in the classroom, not only in terms of what we do, but also in terms of the educational policies that should be implemented. Um, Mr. Kennedy insists that we need to have visuals incorporated in the curriculum. And this is, you know, uh, an interesting step towards improving education by and large. Uh, the visuals also, as he was putting it, uh, engage us and in, uh, they engage our emotions. So it is important that in order for us to find good reasons in the English classroom for students to communicate ideas and thoughts, it is very important that we help them connect with emotions. And this transcends um, the notion that we should always, only, sorry, only go for um, the language and that we should only aim at using language appropriately or correctly. Well, appropriately would be fine. The correct issue is the one that we need to keep on discussing. It is important that students find good things to say, that they can connect emotions and have reasons to communicate their ideas. A little bit more on visual literacy. It may seem to you that this is sort of a new topic. Well, Mr. Kennedy was very clear about that. It is no, not a new concept. Um, Aristotle would talk about uh, images and the importance of visual literacy when he pointed out that without image, thinking is impossible. We need to understand that proficiency with words and with numbers uh, is insufficient and it must be supplemented with some of the basic skills 
uh, that emerge as new technologies develop. We talked about the concept of literacy uh, in the first meeting, and we also said that most teachers circumscribe literacy as learning to use letters. Well, it is not only that, letters or numbers, it's more, and it's the image as well, and that is what we are advocating for in this course. Images are part of our daily life, so we need to embrace them, and we need to embrace new forms of making meaning through images. Uh, Scanner poses, uh, proposes, proposes, sorry, um, multiple literacies are necessary to meet the challenges that we are facing nowadays. And among those skills, he embraces print literacy, visual literacy, media literacy, computer literacy, and so many more. Uh, many different um, definitions of visual literacy have been proposed. Um, we know that they imply I mean, visual literacy implies reading, interpreting and understanding information as is presented in graphic images uh, and it is associated also with visual thinking, um, the ability to turn information of all types and then communicating through them, as um, many authors have claimed. What is uh, that we should consider in terms of visual literacy? that they are used to communicate messages and those messages must be decoded so that they are meaningful and that is uh, the role of the teacher to think of strategies, to think of ways uh, by means of which we can provide students with the necessary skills to decode the images they are exposed to and so find what they are communicating. If visual literacy is regarded as a language in this sense then there is a need uh, a consistent need to know how to communicate using that language. Um, this includes being alert and um, knowing that uh, there's critical reading associated to visual literacy. We need to develop ability to think critically uh, as we see images, as we uh, go back to the first meeting. Um, images are not naive, they're not innocent, they communicate, uh, communicate messages and they can help us also communicate ideas in a different way, not only depending on the written word. Visual literacy, it is important that we understand, is culturally specific. Each social group creates meaning around certain values, notions that we also discussed in the first meeting. Despite that, uh, there are universal symbols, there are universal images we can all relate to and that can be globally understood. The literature in visual literacy suggests that using visual elements in the, in the teaching process um, yields positive results, provides positive outcomes. But what we need is teachers that can um, include those skills, developing skills for visual reading in the teaching process. So a prerequisite for that is that teachers possess the necessary skills to teach those skills to others. Uh, that's why I believe Mr. Kennedy talks about including visuals in the curriculum. If we do so, then we would be preparing teachers for the challenge. Now it's time to share some of the ideas revolving around the images we discussed in the first class. Remember, there was this girl um, and there were many things revolving around her. I asked you, as part of that task, to follow a series of steps and in those steps come up with a story. It is now time to share the story with others. So once again, I'm asking you to go to this uh, site here, to go to Padlet, and as you uh, go there, share your story. It should be a short one, as we said, um, because we are thinking about the possibilities of doing this with our students in primary school, I know. So, let us now take a moment to do the task and also to read what others have come up with, the stories that others have come up with. Then I'll be connecting with the different districts and we'll be sharing ideas around that, okay? See you in a minute.